My name is Sam Wagnin, I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning, and I would like to discuss the recent developments in the interminable Hamas-Israel conflict in Gaza. Don't say I haven't told you so, or <laughs> watch my previous videos. Let's start with the hostage deal. Rafah sits on the borders of both Israel and Egypt. It is the main traffic corridor for both humanitarian aid and military material for Hamas smuggled in. About 50% of the fighting force of Hamas have relocated to Rafah and spread from there northwards into other areas of Gaza vacated by the Israeli army. The city sits atop a hyper-complex network of tunnels of all kinds. Only a few days ago, Hamas launched a rocket attack from Rafah on Israeli armed forces who were guarding the truck terminal in Kerem Shalom. Israel is committed to the unrealistic goal of eradicating Hamas and assassinating its top military leaders who are in hiding in Rafah or Han Yunis, surrounded by live hostages as human shields. Israel is likely to take Rafah one neighborhood at a time, making it easier to move the civilian population out of harm's way, as per the demands of the United States and the international community. About 700,000 of the Palestinians currently in the city are refugees from north and central Gaza, and Israel will probably allow them to return to what is left of their homes, very little. Even so, the logistical challenge of providing hundreds of thousands of civilians with protection, food and shelter is unlikely to be tackled successfully. Many civilians are bound to end up as collateral damage. But Israel is unlikely to pay heed to the exhortations of the European Union or even to the threats and pressures of the Biden administration, a recent arms embargo included. And it's unlikely to pay attention for two reasons. First, Hamas have threatened to repeat the October 7 atrocities, slaughter and rapes of Israeli civilians. Israel now regards Hamas and Iran as existential threats. The US and the EU have only fought distant enemies they have never faced an existential threat. Israel is right to ignore them both. The second reason is Netanyahu's political survival and his personal freedom. He faces several criminal charges in multiple cases, and both depend on accomplishing the goals of the war or on dragging it out. Also, the longer the war, the more likely people are to recover from the traumatic shock of the Hamas massacres and to vote for Netanyahu. He is now a hostage of Israel's far-right political parties. The United States, the Arab world and the international community want to secure a permanent ceasefire, each for their own reasons. And so, so do Hamas, who wish to regroup, rearm, regain governance of Gaza and live to attack Israel another day. Israel wants to continue the fighting, punctuated as it is by weeks of truce and swaps of Israeli hostages versus Palestinian prisoners. These goals are incompatible, and therefore, even if such a truce were to be agreed on, it is very likely to be breached and to lead to renewed fighting. So this is the picture with the hostages. Now what about the campus protests and divestment? Students in dozens of campuses in the United States and elsewhere, France, Australia, are calling on their universities and colleges to divest from Israel and from Israeli companies, owing to the genocide that it is allegedly perpetrating in Gaza. It is not the first time that Israel is subjected to such censure. The Arab League boycott of Israel forced many multinationals to divest, disinvest from Israel over the first few decades of its existence. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, in 2004, the General Assembly, the governing body of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, approved selective divestment from corporations doing business with Israel 
out of objection to the country's perceived violation of the human rights of Palestinians. In 2014, continues the encyclopedia, the General Assembly voted in favor of divesting from three major U.S. corporations that conducted business in Israel. Countries such as South Africa, Myanmar, Burma, and Sudan have also felt the brunt of this investment, and so did certain sectors, most notably the tobacco and fossil fuel industries. But times are different now, two or three decades later. While there is an increased awareness of the social and ethical responsibility of businesses and institutions, as well as a proliferation of ESG, environmental, social and governance investment funds, several other transformations have rendered divestment practically impossible. First, endowment managers have a fiduciary duty to maximize returns. They have no other obligation under the law. Return on investment trumps values, ethics, morality and politics. It is a criminal offense to behave otherwise. Number two, most higher education endowments are invested in mutual funds, index funds and other investment vehicles that make it impossible to opt out of specific securities on whatever grounds. Third, there is no consensus on values. People are polarized and radicalized. Someone's beliefs and convictions are always offensive to others and at best arguable and relative. To expect universities or corporations to serve as axiological arbiters is impractical. Divestment is a potent form of geopolitical virtue signaling against pariah states. It has minimal economic effects though, but the mere demand to impose it on a rogue polity bears grave implications. So even if the students were to fail in their mission, the harm has been done to Israel's reputation, capacity to conduct business, to engage in academic and scientific exchanges, and to participate in international events and affairs. Eurovision comes to mind.